Welcome to another edition of the Empower Hour. I am Al Kumar. And I am Hanifa. And, and this is Nagasi. That is Nagasi. And we are your hosts each and every Wednesday where we come to you live with uh, impactful topics of discussion that affect our everyday lives. And today it's going to be one of those discussions. Um, topic is sleeping with the enemy. Ooh. Are we sleeping with the enemy? How does societal norms impact our relationships? So that's the discussion today. And to help us out, we have Brother Edward X. Um, he's going to be joining us on the split screen from his side of town and in just a second. And so once we get him up on the screen, he's going to, because we wanted to have some of that masculine energy, you know, um, for this discussion because we're talking relationship woes. <laughs> or maybe not. Maybe, maybe the society impacts our relationship for the better. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> Let's see. There's our brother, Edward X. How are you doing today? Assalamu alaikum. What's happening? Black power. I'm good. Assalamu alaikum. And family, if you guys are joining us on any of our social media networks, um, and you want to see the whole show live with Brother Ed on the screen and everything, hop on over to eLife Media on the Facebook page. That's eLife Media, and you'll see us live streaming right there. You can catch it there. All right. So, Brother Edward. Yes, ma'am. How are things going on your end of the town? Let's, let's get a brief update on what's going on with you. As far as what? As far as um, your day-to-day -day activities, I know you're right out there uh, in the streets, southeast Washington, D.C., to be specific, well, yeah, mainly, mainly. Right now, I'm at the uh, Ward 8 Business Center on um, 4135 Willow Roads, um, southeast D.C., and um, as you know, we are experiencing like a bunch of homicides in um, the District of Columbia right now, so a lot of uh, people are young people are being murdered every day in the district and so we just trying to address that and tackle that yeah yeah so your boots are definitely on the ground and we thank you so much for um, all the work you do and with the young folks in the district attempting to um curtail all that violence and i know it ain't easy praise be to Allah. yes it's definitely easy it's right but today's topic we're going to um navigate through that a little bit and go come on to the relationships okay okay and uh we definitely wanted to have you on uh specifically because you can relate so what does that mean i can relate <laughs> well, <laughs> well I, <laughs> am i wrong <laughs> do you not relate to um chop you know the how society impacts our yes. relationships? Yes, I just was looking for clarity. That's all. I'm just looking for clarity. <laughs> make sure that well, when sometimes we can't hear you, so make sure that you're speaking up, brother Edward. Okay, you know I had these headphones on because I'm in the office. So uh, can you can you hear me now? Yeah, we, yeah, we can, can hear you. Hear you a okay. Little better now. Okay. okay. All right. So I just wanted to start with um, what it, what is your take on that on how society impacts our relationships? What's, what's your initial thought when you hear that? Does society impact our relationships for the better, you think? No. No? I think that, I, no, I don't think they impact our relationship for the better, but I definitely think that our relationships are impacted in such a way that I have taken a position, can you hear me? Yeah. I have taken a position that the only way that I will uh, get married is if the sister, whoever she may be, has to agree to individual counseling and group counseling. And I'm not opposed to going to counseling for myself as an individual, but she has to be willing and she isn't willing to engage in that. Ain't nothing happening. Wow. So you're saying you're prepared to go to counseling and that's big for a brother. And you don't necessarily, you don't normally hear that. From oh, brothers. absolutely. Well, I'm um, as a student of Dr. Um, Francis Cress Wilson, and others, I know that we, we, we are wounded and we are dysfunctional. And um, having been stripped of the knowledge itself, as a black people, we don't know how to relate to one another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we are honest. Okay. okay. 
And so when you take a, a black woman who in her thirties or forties and you look at um, what she has experienced as an inner city black woman, where does her values come from? And if she does have values, where are they reinforced that in society? Because when we look at Cardi B and Nicki Minaj and, and the stuff, the music that is um, popping the airwaves and the propaganda that exists, we need we need therapy. We're dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can look at our community, you can look at our relationships, you can look at the condition of our children to know that the way we are doing it doesn't work. requesting so what we're going to do is we're going to go back and forth on the screen okay. because um, we definitely want to keep you on Ed, but we want to make this an interactive discussion with the whole community so I okay. see that somebody's requesting to join us on the main screen so I'm going to get them in let's see who's this Hello. 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 okay Yes, they left. Okay. But if y'all, again, if you guys want to join us on the conversation and you're on the screen, just um, request us and we'll come and put you in on the conversation. How much of this that we're dealing with you think is um, mental illness? Brother Ed? The majority of it is uh, mental illness. When you talk about um, our mental health, and mental health wellness. You know, if a person um, does a physical workout and, and, and he, he engages in physical wellness, or you do spiritual things in, in spiritual wellness, what are we doing for our mental health as a people uh, who have been under white supremacy for the past 500 years, a people who have been stripped of our name, language, culture, religion, history, folkways, mores, and norms, a people who have been turned upside down and inside out, what ha have we done to address that? Nothing. And so we are dysfunctional as men and women. And so our dysfunctionality is displayed in our interactions with one another. And so all we do in our community is attack one another. If you talk to the average black man and talk about the problems, he's going to say it's the black woman. And if you talk to the average black woman and ask her what's the problem, she's going to say it's the black man. That's the truth. That's the truth. And meanwhile, nothing gets solved. We, we, we're fighting against one another and blaming the other. And that's one of my questions about how is that effective? How is blaming the opposite sex for all our challenges effective? Is that helpful? Is it helping us? Is well, it moving um, us in the right direction? We must, and we must always be honest. So we have a conversation. We must be honest, and I think that um, is as there a, any way you can brother, get clear? Are you like on a? Is it a speaker that you can get clearer into, brother Ed? Because if I talk, like, if I hold this, is it louder? If I talk, hold, hold it like this. It's a little better. Okay, I hold it like this. Okay. So as as a brother, um, I see the power of black women, mm -hmm. and black women don't know their own power and so black women believe that their power is in their behind or in their form mm -hmm. right but your power is in your person your being and if black women took a position on issues it would change our condition it would change our community and so like in the 60s um elaine brown and the black panther the women of the black panther party in the 60s they took a position saying that if a brother wasn't a revolutionary, if he wasn't black and conscious and fighting in the community for the community, they wasn't dealing with him. They wouldn't have sex with him. But here go black women in our community. You got power and you don't even utilize it. You could say, man, I'm not messing with Mook Mook, Ray Ray, little man because they sell drugs. I'm not messing with them because they kill black people. I'm not messing with them because they are counterproductive. They ain't, they're not standing up for liberation. And if you took a position like that, black women, and stood on it, you would be surprised at how many people would be being educated. I'm doing an interview right now. Um, and, it, and it, a lot of things would change. Mm. It's like if they took those positions and stood on those positions, 
they would make black men pull their pants up. They would make black men stop killing each other. They would make black men read. They would make black men educated. They would make black men do more as a community. If black women knew the power of their men or of the odd men. I feel like um, when you say power, uh, and this is more recent because I think like probably up to maybe a month ago, I would have been like, yes, we have a responsibility and so do our men. And I've just kind of been observing and I have actually been interpreting blame, what we, what we are perceiving as blame as women I have been perceiving as power and man, men telling us just how much power we have. But our, right. our, our way of thinking and being so combative all the time with the black man does not allow us to see that. It's an opportunity. It's, black men are saying, you guys have the power, but we are, we are receiving it as blame. Now, right. what are some of the things as a woman, as a black woman particularly, what are some of the things that we can begin to do that you think can begin to cause changes in our men? Take a firm position. Like, uh, if you look at the homicides in our community, right? Black men killing black men. Black women like the shooter. If we, if, if, if we, if, if we remove our emotions and look at our own personal lives, look at the music that you're listening to, what is the music talking about that's in your car right now, that's in your CD player? What is the music talking about? It's talking about killing black people. Right. And black women like that. When you listen to Nicki Minaj and, uh, and Cardi B, what are they talking about? Right. But you like it. Right. It's in your CD player right now. But you will tell me don't disrespect you. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. Mm -hmm. But you really like it. You don't want to change black women like the shooter in the community right whether you say you like him because he make you feel protected he, whatever your reason for liking him you promote that mentality right. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you promote the mentality of one a brother that's a thug right right like if a brother that's a square you be like i don't want him right. he's too square <laughs> you like that griminess you like it and unless you admit well, that you like it you, Swag, yeah. <laughs> you like the grind and you don't want the straight right. narrow brother that's hard working and they get up, you know, and 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 and, and there are characteristics that, there are characteristics that come with that mentality. So when now you get yeah. the brother that's a thug, that's a, the, a, a he from the hood, now that you have him, now what? Well, let's, well let's, let's go back a little because, again, okay. I, I, I'm big on root causes and I always want to go back to have people understand and realize why they even have these sort of attractions. You know, so we, because we, a lot of us, we just go through the day-to-day -day motions. We don't even stop to consider what it is about our character that even drawn or attracted to these type of right. um, personalities. Right. So let's let's talk about that a little bit. Why do you think uh, some of us? It's not all. <laughs> right. Some of us are attracted to dysfunctionality. Honestly, I think that all black people are dysfunctional. This is the position that I take, mm -hmm. and the reason why I take this position is because you cannot uh, function in a system of white supremacy where you wear somebody else's name. You speak somebody else's language. You uh, uh, embrace someone else's culture. You can't be whole. You don't know yourself. Thus, you can't develop a sense of functionality in a system that's not yours. Thus, you are dysfunctional. Thus, I am dysfunctional. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you're basically saying, I mean, is it suffice to say as long as we're in this cesspool? of a culture that we can we can expect more of the same? Absolutely. So what, Absolutely. Is, what are the solutions though? But, but is it possible to rectify that and remain in this society? Is it possible right. for it to happen in the midst of what's happening to us? 
Yes, because uh, W. E. B. Du Bois talked about the double consciousness. Yes. So we know we know that we are messed up, and so we can address our issues. We can begin to address our issues and begin to focus on self and practice self healing, self love, mm -hmm. uh, self respect. But you can't practice that if you don't know, don't acknowledge that something is wrong. The average black person ask them what's wrong with them and what they're working on. They're gonna say nothing is wrong with me, yes. and I ain't working on nothing. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we, we're, we're, we're in this new culture now where it's um, bragging rights to be, you know, to, sing, to be the single right. parent or the single mom right. or, you know, right. the I don't need a man mentality and, you know what I'm saying? Which comes from the whole single parent household epidemic <laughs> that we, where we have in our community. That's where, that's where we take that attitude on from. Um, my my um thing is okay so in this mess of society and all our dysfunctionality right right we're still trying to do relationship mm -hmm. right is it is counseling enough is, is what enough counseling because you mentioned counseling in the beginning is that enough well i think it's a process and, and, and each person because, um, like sorry. water seeks its own level so 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 counseling for one person six months of counseling might help them. Another person, three months of counseling might help them. Another person may need continued counseling. So it just depends on the person. Now, can you, can you define counseling here? Because if there's someone with no knowledge of self, because you right. pointed out that as part of our issue, there's many of people across this nation who are going to counseling and have no knowledge of self. So when we talk about counseling, should this be include that should it include some sort of knowledge as far as our history is concerned because now absolutely that because a lot of the counselors don't even have the knowledge of self absolutely so right. they're counseling you, if, other if, people if you, if you look at our history right in Africa, they, they had like manhood rituals and womanhood yes. rituals that you had to engage in yes. to become a man or a woman yeah. But in our community, we don't have rituals that, 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 that deem yeah, you a man. Age, in our yeah. community, you, you get locked up and you ain't snitch. You're a man. Wow. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, well, I want to get Saladin in on the discussion. Saladin, Amar, Muhammad, Amir, Amar, excuse me. Um, this society has impacted the black community on the negative. However, that dissatisfaction promotes a change for the better only from those who are dissatisfied and want to work to better themselves in the family and community. I witnessed myself, many of my childhood friends lose their sanity, including a sister I used to court as a young teenager. And it affected me when I seen her in that state. So separation or separating ourselves from this mentally and spiritually dead society is not an option. It's a requirement for good mental health. Thoughts? What's your thoughts on that, Brother Ed? I agree. Mm. Yeah. I agree yeah, I, I'm, I'm wondering if we could do but so much if we're still in the cesspool that caused us so much mental distress. I mean, but a lot of people in our community don't even acknowledge that. Yeah. See, what we're looking at in our community, I, and I said this uh, recently on social media, we are witnessing the culmination of all of us all these years saying, I ain't into that black stuff. Mm -hmm. So you don't, because you ain't into that black stuff, you ain't going to read no book. Because you ain't into that black stuff, you ain't going to watch no documentary. Because you ain't into that black stuff, you're not going to read this literature. But by not doing so, your sons are killing each other mm -hmm. every single day and you don't have no solutions. Mm -hmm. Because your way don't work. So if you're not into that black stuff, then what are you into? That white stuff. And that white stuff is killing us. Absolutely. Steve. So I uh, briefly, well, I, I think this was like, we, I think we talked like, uh, I spoke with Alkama last week and I was saying that perhaps we're doing relationships wrong. Perhaps we should consider the fact that relationship, consider how relationships function in a time of war, war versus a time of peace. Mm. And I'm not sure that we can afford to do relationships as if we are in a time of peace when we are actually at war. Good point. And so I guess I'm trying to figure out, like, I feel, and, and, and if you can expound on this, I personally feel like 
because we are at war, our relationships, we need a little more of everything. Mm -hmm. You know how they, you know how some people say their parents raised them, you gotta be two times better? Yeah. Why don't mm -hmm. we apply this to our relationships? We apply it when we're going after careers. We apply it in the workforce. Mm -hmm. We apply it when we're going after our dreams. Oh, mm -hmm. I've always been told I need to walk twice as, hard, twice as hard, and some of us are proud of that. So why can't we apply that same thing to our relationships? I feel like as black people loving another black people, we ought to forgive a little more. I feel like we need to hang in there a little longer. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think we need to show grace a little bit more to each other. What do you think about us doing relationships in a time of war as if we are in a time of peace? Let me just say, uh, no, you could. I, I want to say that I think even in that instance, we have to understand that we are at war. Right. And so right. we are navigating through this landmine without even understanding who's setting the traps. Right. And so, you know, like, so what Hanifa said so eloquently, we don't. We don't take the extra steps because we understand. Those who understand will take the extra steps. Yes. But if true. you don't understand that you are in a war zone, and that you gotta be extra loving to somebody because they're going through some stuff yes. as well as you're going yes. through some stuff. Yes. So we gotta make some exceptions here exactly. because of this this, exactly. this war. Yes. But if you don't know you at war, you, you're not gonna make those exceptions. Brother Ed? That's deep because the first step is to get the people to acknowledge that you at war. Yeah. That's the first step. Yeah. And, and, and because you at war, you develop a different system of interacting because of the war, right? right? right. But our, our community don't know that. Our community doesn't know that. If, if Mook Mook, Red Red, Little Man knew that they was at war, they wouldn't be shooting each other. Right. So, so we could look at the news and can tell from the news where our people's mind is. Right. Right. We, could look at, we could look at what's acceptable to us. If you look at the black woman in America, by and large, if the black woman get beat up by the police, you know what the black man gonna do? Pull out his phone and record. He's not yes. prepared to die. Yes. Mm. He definitely ain't prepared to kill. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, so, I, you know, and I, I think I want to just get into some examples of um, some of the dysfunctionality that, that we um, attribute to in the relationships. So, you know, and I, I think of like so much of the um, um, domestic abuse, physical and verbal. I agree sides. with you. I agree with you. And um, we need a system of accountability in our community. We need a system where as a, if, if I, as a husband, or, in, in, you know, there ain't that many husbands, or if I, as a boyfriend, a am abusive, we should have a system. If I put my hand on her, if it's a brother or uncle, somebody should. Don't call the police, though. Mm -hmm. Calling the police on me should never be there. You know, you understand that we should have a system mm -hmm. in place that when I'm in error, I can be violated. I could be stepped to. I could be brought to justice, but not by the police, not by the white man. Yeah. 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 That again, that's because thinking in, in terms of war. So you're thinking as a as a general in the war. You, you, you know, you know what, uh, brother Edward, as you're saying that, I I completely 100% agree with that. But I also agree with what Alkamar and yourself was just saying, which is the mind state, right? Because I recently was so I saw kind of like a dialogue taking place on Facebook, and it was an incident of bullying. Um, and this, these were elementary kids. And the advice to the one parent was press charges. These are elementary children, mm. black children. Mm. And immediately my mind went to, no, mm. no. Get the principal, get the teachers, get the mamas, the grandmas from both sides and figure this thing out. Yes. Why right. would you call the police on a fifth? fourth and sixth grader. Why? Because but it takes a change of mindset yeah. to even take that position. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. You know what I mean? We we afraid of the police until we want to weaponize them against each other. Hmm. Good teacher. That's real. You know? That's real. 
Yeah. So it does take a change of mindset. And it's a, and that's a European mentality. Because what your what what they what they have done is um take our children or see our children as full fledged adults. And so now we do too. <laughs> so it's nothing for us to call the police on a on a on a little child. Yeah. On yeah. one of our, that where, like you said, where instead of us stepping up and taking better responsibility of what's going on with our children. Now, let me, let me say this real quick. Um, in, in Ward 8, over 80% of the households in Ward 8 are headed by black women. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So that's almost like 90%, mm -hmm. which means every 10 black houses you see nine of them are ran by black women mm -hmm. out of every 10 houses you see only one has a black man in it with those alarming statistics a person with little or no education you don't have to read a rack of books you would have to conclude that this is by design there's something set against us mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah and then you have rules and laws in place that you you know you on a voucher you can't let no black man come in your house he can't come in your house and you're gonna lose your voucher yeah. see all of this stuff is by design to destroy the black family and, and and if you're not conscious and don't know what's going on you're not in the know then you by your ignorance are a pawn and an agent of white supremacy you get caught up right in the traps you get snared right in the traps and here absolutely you are. You know, here we are looking around saying what happened. But I want to go back to um, the, some of the dysfunctional things that we do in relationships. And I just want to tell the story because you have mentioned, you know, about not calling the police but handling the situation ourselves or having an organized scenario to where, um, you know, our women or men can call and, and it could be handled and rectified. And it goes back for me to a story my father used to tell me, because my father was in the nation back under the leadership of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And right. um, he used to tell me that one time this woman came into the mosque, they both, her and her husband were members of the mosque um, that he was a member of, and she informed the brothers in the mosque that he had hit her. Or he was beating on her. I can't remember the hot the details, but they he told me the next time that they saw that man in the mosque, the brothers took him and threw him down the flight of stairs, <laughs> and they told that brother if he ever put his hands on that woman again, he can expect a lot more. And the woman never had that issue again. So again, going back to handling our own situation, we don't if you know what I'm saying if there was enough men to step up and just own as, you know, take some responsibility, men and women, this is going to take us right. all, you know, it really right. is, to step up and, 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 and take the reins of leaders to take, you know, to organize something, because it can be done. It's just everybody is waiting on somebody else to do it. That's, right. That's, that's what I was going to say. Ed, uh, Brother Edward just quoted a statistic. He just said, is it eighty percent? You said, brother X. Over eighty. Over eighty percent. We need to hear that as women. Yeah. That is power. That is power. Over eighty percent is headed by women. So, in other words, I'm thinking. I'm not saying that this is the ideal. I'm saying that as I'm saying this as a black woman and to other black women, just consider this. If we could just stop for one minute and say, whoa, this thing is in my favor, okay? To start shifting my community in the way that I would like it to see. Mm -hmm. Because we have the upper hand. It's not anti-man when I say that. Mm -hmm. What That's I'm right. saying is, we are at an advantage here. What are we doing with that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So right. If, if I'm just saying to any black woman listening, Look at that, and you, that's that's just one. Po that's a portion of DC that you quoted. All right, let's talk nationally, uh, nationwide. Most black households are headed by women. Okay, so it's sort of like, what do, what are we going to do as black women? Are we going to sit and say, "Woe is us"? Yeah. Mm. Because 
80 percent or more, 80 percent plus is headed by us. Our men have abandoned us, war is us. Or are we going to say, you know what? We have the opportunity to change this thing because the numbers are on our side. What do we do? What do we do with it? Are we going to start raising our boys differently? So that we can raise men who are there in the household? Or are we going to sit down and have a pity party with our girlfriends? We have to make a decision. Yeah, 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 because it is. It's a, it's a dire scenario. It really is. And, and it affects us all. Even, the, even those who are happily married and are, you know, doing their thing and doing all the things that they're supposed to be doing. They butt up against these individuals <laughs> on a daily basis in some way, shape, or form, who are struggling along. So it affects us all and it behooves us all to um to be more to, to be more proactive. To be more proactive. Absolutely. I have a question Absolutely. about the relationships, Brother Edward. Mm -hmm. Um right. we, we we the topic we're talking about particularly is like what are so how does the stresses of the society we live in how do they impact our relationship? And I want to say, how do they impact our relationships directly? Okay, Can you well, give I think us some my black, examples as a man. My black brother's about to get mad at me on this one. Okay. My black brother's about to get mad at me on this because I think that the black man, I'm on Facebook Live. Um, I think that my black brothers are scared of the white man. Mm. Black men, by and large, not every one of us, but it's enough of us that are afraid and because we are afraid of white supremacy we are afraid of the um, to address okay. white supremacy in a real confrontational way so as cowards we take it out on our women you ever seen somebody get bullied as, and, and they never address that but then they bully somebody else yes. that's how we are as black men so, so white, the white man bully us and so we scared of him so we turn around and bully our women because that's the only way we feel like we uh, men. When you say they bully us, how? Well, give us some examples of how, you know, the Europeans bully us. Give you some examples? Yeah. <laughs> you got his name, he ain't got your name. I mean, uh, the stuff like uh, the police, uh, the brutality, uh, the mob attacks, oh, uh, 500 years of brutality. Not that he just gonna go in your pocket, but I'm talking about not no individual instance, but col the collective white supremacy against us as a community, as black men. And in the last 500 years, we haven't taken a stand. Mm -hmm. We've showed like signs of resistance, but by and large, we've never taken a stand. What would and that so, look like, taking a stand against um, racism and white supremacy? Well, black people annually spend $1.1 trillion a year so if we took that money that we uh, spend as consumers and turn inwardly and put our money together in a kitty and develop like a national black bank for us, we can end unemployment in our community. We can create uh, um, manufacturing companies to, to, to employ our people. We can create uh, schools to educate our children. We can do everything that is necessary to make us independent if we, if we just come together. Yeah, so that economic piece is, is vital. That economic piece is vital. Yeah. So um, I, I heard um, uh, brother Boyce Watkins posted on his uh, page yesterday. He said something along the lines of um, to 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 ask for reparations and then turn around and give over a trillion dollars back to the same people you asking reparations to for. It's like asking a doctor to give me a good surgeon, give me a good heart surgery, and then when he done, you stab yourself right in the chest with the knife. Right, right. That's real. That's real. So it's like our priorities are misconstrued. And that's because we don't know, you know? Yeah. We don't, we honestly don't know. We honestly are good people. We are good people, but we yes. suffer from self-hatred. Yes. We hate one another. We love white people, and we display it. Mm -hmm. We display it with each other. Uh, if you just look at the news, um, you don't have to read a lot of books. The condition is such that you could just look at the news. We kill each other every day. 
a, a 11 year old little boy was just murdered by a 29 year old black man in DC. Mm -hmm. How does a 29 year old man shoot an 11 year old unless that 29 year old has mental health issues? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you could dress it up and say you were defending your stepson or whatever you want to use to say, but it's, 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 it's a dysfunctionality that's not being addressed. Yes. And, and we see these meltdowns every day. Like I work at the Ward 8 Business Center. I see it every day in the community. Black yeah. women have meltdowns. Black men have meltdowns. And it's all because we're not addressing our mental health. Yeah, and it's, and it's interesting that you even said that because what I'm finding, I don't know if you guys have, have the same, um, I'm finding this as well, but I'm finding a lot of people out there will say things like, Oh, that you they using that mental health as an excuse. Oh, they you know, they, they know better, they shouldn't have done that, and mental crazy or no crazy. And and I don't know if you guys get that, but I'm on social media a lot and I read a lot of comments and when something goes down that just for me is less like straight dysfunctional, mental illness. But people will be like, That's an excuse. Nah, he need to, you know, he need to die. So it's like, I don't even think we even have the proper understanding of mental illness. Listen, Alkamar, this morning, I said, I put a post up this morning on Facebook. I said, good morning, kings and queens. And a conscious brother said, don't greet me with that uh, white man greeting. Say, assalamu alaikum. And I blocked him. <laughs> and I blocked him because I was like, <laughs> you so... Your mental health is so gone, so off, that I say good morning, and you can find a flaw in that. Good teacher. You can find a flaw in that. Mm -hmm. What type of Negro who profess to be conscious is looking for fault mm -hmm. in something black? I say good morning, kings and queens. Yeah. yeah. Kings and queens. Yeah. I ain't say niggas and niggas. Right, 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 right. Yeah, and I think that's because I think I heard Ayala teach it. She said, "We be, you can become addicted to pain." I think we we a, a lot of us are entered a place where the pain and suffering is so consistent and ongoing that we just in it. We swimming in it and ain't trying let to me, get out. Let me say this. So and when I, you come like, with some with some good energy, or some positive energy, that that you know that that's uncomfortable for them because they're comfortable in the pain. You want to say I don't that? even I don't even refer to myself as being a part of the conscious community anymore because of most of the um, ignorance that I see displayed dealing with black people come from the conscious community. Those who say they in the know, all they do is find fault in anything. Mm -hmm. Anything you try, they're gonna find fault in it. Like uh, I was saying that. Um, Recently, I said black men are scared of their own sons, their nephews, their cousins, their little brothers. We're scared of our, our, our children. And then a brother came on my post and said, well, what, you, what black men you talking about? Because not the black men I know. The black men I know, they soldiers. And woo, 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 woo. And I said, well, damn, where are they? Because those black men you talking about, we need them in the community to show some progress. If y'all know how to... um all these entrepreneur skills and how to elevate our community, all this, all this cultural know-how. Where in the hell are you at? Because mm -hmm. the only people you're teaching is the people who think just like you. That's true. Which means you are part of the problem. Mm. That is so very true. That is so, and I have to watch myself and not to get caught up in that because it's, it's a Conscious Nick will walk right past Mook Mook Ray Ray and Little Man to go to a rally with a bunch of conscious people but the people who need to hear the message you walk right past them and you were scared to say something to them when you went in there that's that's real that's the God honest truth so it's like yeah it's just like this bringing that to folks attention so they can better understand um, but going back to the dysfunction in our specifically in our relationships as it relates to male female um, how does child support play? What role does child support play in um, <laughs> in um, causing a greater divide? 
uh, let me tell you something. It's amazing that you would ask that because actually I'm, I am one of those brothers and I, 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 I like to look at myself as a good brother. Like I see myself as a good black man. I'm striving. I'm not perfect. I got faults and shortcomings and issues, but Ooh. essentially I'm striving, right, and trying to be a better person. And I'm on child support. And I told my um son, mother, I was like, like, you know, you know that can affect your relationship with your child. Like, if you paying your child support to the, through the courts and it goes to the mother, then when you have your child, it can affect your relationship if you're not mature. Because if you paid your child support and then you would, got your child, and he'd be like, I want this or that. You'd be like, man, you better go holler at your mother. And a lot of people are not that mature. And I, I can be honest on, on one of the things, I, can say, I ain't gonna say the only thing, but one of the things that make me have a different perspective is, is because I'm conscious. Mm -hmm. so, 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 so being conscious again is, is essential. Yeah. But yeah, that's one of another dysfunctionality. Uh, black women use the, uh, the children as a weapon. Um, and, and a lot of times, uh, black men who aren't conscious uh, just leave, just roll out. They're tired of dealing with that dysfunctionality, and, and then the child internalized that abandonment and rejection. So that's another uh, issue that developed from the dysfunctionalities of those relationships. Right. How would you know? How important are elders? in addressing the dysfunctionality that keeps appearing and manifesting itself in our relationships to each other. The reason I why I'm asking, I'm sorry, the reason why I'm asking that question is because grandmothers are becoming younger and younger, right? And most mm -hmm. of us are not really coming into the knowledge of self until way in our 40s, close to our mm -hmm. 50s. And, mm -hmm. and some people, more, a lot of us are grandmothers before even hitting 50, okay? This mm -hmm. is a real thing now. And what I'm finding is that the, the supposed wisdom or the advice that's coming from what we would consider that we, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm of the mind that elders don't necessarily have to do with your age anymore. I've like let that go. Um, but I'm noticing that you have grandmothers whose advice I cringe at mm. because they haven't dealt with their mental health. They haven't dealt with their own to toxic issues that's within their, so their own abuse and they themselves are single women, right? And so their advice, you come into them and maybe you're not married yet. Maybe you're just with a brother and you're really trying to make this work because now you are in the know now, right? I'm right. finding that when you go to these people or these older people for advice, you better off getting it from a, a, another pair of yours the same age. So how important is the elders in addressing our dysfunctionality? And if we are scarce on elders, what, we, what do we do? I mean, elders with sound advice. Okay. Um, in our community, we used to have what we call Big Mama. She might have been a grandmother or the elder in the family. Everybody listened to her. She can correct the family when, when your aunt and your uncle are arguing. She, she'll get them together, make both of them be quiet. So Big Mama in the black community is dying off. Yes. So Big Mama, as she dies off, the little mama, she's so pressed to give her children what uh, she didn't have that she is forgetting to give her what she did have which was values and principles, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that, that that's, 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 that's crippling our community, the, the death mm -hmm. of Big Mama. Big Mama, like in my personal family, my grandmother, when she departed, like she was the only person that can bring, she was the glue. And now the people that she was the glue for, you would never see them again in the same room unless it's at, at a funeral. It's, 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 it's very interesting that you pointed out Big Mama um, because even when during a time when we considered our families were more intact, I would say before integration, <laughs> even, right. even then, the black woman has always held a powerful position 
in our community, always, even with the presence of our men in the home, that was always there. And that just came to my mind as you're talking about like Big Mama. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure, I know a part of it is integration. How much mm -hmm. does integration play a part in what we're talking about as far as the dysfunctionality in our relationships? I think it's, it play a major role. I think it play a major role because what you're looking at is some deaf, dumb, and blind black people who are trying to be white. And we get shocked every time that white folk let us know we're not white. If you look at all of our movements, it, it, they, they stem from the rejection of white people, for, from um, white people rejecting black people, and we get offended. And so we organize movements around that rejection. Please accept all of, me. All of our no justice, no peace movement stem from us thinking we white and then an incident of white folk showing us you're not one of us. And we are so shocked, we got to organize against this. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. There's a lot of that going on now with the whole Trump thing when he said, go send her back. to." So there's a lot of people coming up with videos now. You know, my feelings were so hurt. They told me this when I was young. And I, I'm still traumatized by it. And I'm just like, who told you? Who ever told you that white people loved you? Who ever? told you that like and why were you told that it's a lie mm. so what now you are as an adult why are you so hurt because, by this because why you, do you want to be loved mm -hmm. right that's why but, you but these people that have done the most diabolical things to people that look like you when have they ever loved us and you want to squeeze in you and it goes back to what he said really. you're looking for white validation yes you are yes you, and that's why you're so hurt that's why you're so hurt because <laughs> me, I laugh. I laugh. Call it what you want. But when I hear Trump say silly, ignorant things out his mouth, it's funny to me because I don't get offended because I know who my enemy is. So why am I going to get so offended and hurt and crying and all in my feelings when my enemy is displaying who he is? His let, me say, let me say something. Let me say something. I am. My brother Jahar right here, he said this the other day to me. He was talking about Cory Booker. Cory Booker is a presidential candidate, right, from um, New Jersey. Yes. And they asked him about meeting with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, right? And he said he would, but then white people got on him. And you so scared of white Jews yeah, that you say now you, would, you wouldn't meet with the minister. But here go a man in black America, we number 30 to 40 million people. 40 million people and he called a million man march and it's arguable some people say two million showed up some people say a million and a half you know they argue about the numbers but nonetheless it was the largest uh, organization of us as a people as black men and, and and you would refuse to meet with him because of what white people think so who are you working for who are you trying to receive acceptance from yeah. and this is our leadership these are the people that we allow to, uh, uh, that we look up to and then say they represent, they don't represent us. If you won't meet with the minister, you represent Jews. That's right. That's right. Most of, most of what, what we are. Jahad, Jahad, Jahad said, he, that's how you going to tell Trump to meet with him. <laughs> hey, Jahad. Hey. <laughs> most, of, most of what we are calling, I've come to the point where I'm noticing most of what we are calling black excellence is just we are plodding acceptance into white spaces mm -hmm. and we Absolutely. are labeling it black excellence that is something that i am noticing mm -hmm. and i'm just like i think i hold my applaud i love mm -hmm. black people and i love to see us progress mm -hmm. but why is it only considered mm -hmm. success when it's acceptance into white spaces mm -hmm. what is that about mm -hmm. that, that so, hey. of self and before you go on i want to get um the um youtube family on because okay. there's been some good comments um brother kushite Prince says, you must be mentally and spiritually healed first before you can truly love another person. So that's going right into what we're talking about. It's like, you know, if we don't have the self-love, the love of ourselves, then yeah, we're going to seek that validation outside of ourselves and outside of our communities. Because we really don't want nothing to do with our community. We want, we want to be there. We want to be on the equal playing field with our open enemies. Basically, um, and then 
somebody else had said early on, um, Okushite again, he said, uh, a lot of our people are addicted to pain and drama. This is why so many of our relationships fail. We have to heal our minds and spirit. Too many of us look for another person to complete us. Anybody want to take that on? Edward, I, addicted, addicted to drama. Isn't that the normalization of, 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 uh, of trauma mm. in our community? Mm. We, we normalize trauma to the point where we go into our relationships looking for drama. And if it's not there, we will create it. We're magical in that sense. You know that. <laughs> and we see this on a regular basis online of how we respond and reshare traumatic events that happen in our society. That's all we do. In a lot of instances, not all, but that's for a lot of us. That's what we do. It's like, oh, look, they killed Moo Boo. Oh, look, this happened. Oh, look. You know what I'm saying? Oh, look. You know what I'm saying? It's like, well, wait a minute, what are we doing in, in retaliation to that? What are we doing to counter those narratives? Why, you know what I'm saying? What We're just stuck in victim mode. Edward, is marriage, can marriage be used to counter a lot of what we're talking about? Hmm. I mean, if you're going through a, a, a process of healing, like self-healing, you can't love the next person if you don't love yourself. And I, 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 lately I've been hearing a lot of black women say, uh, I don't want to be his mother. I want to be his wife. And yes. he's looking for a mother. I've, I've been hearing that a lot lately. I guess that's a new saying among y'all. Uh, but I've been hearing that a lot. So we definitely need to be healing. I think that emerge, emerge as, a, as a process to heal us, I think that's good, but we got to heal ourselves and know who we are first as an individual before we get, because we ain't going to bring our problems to the next person. Yeah. If we never address our issues. And so as I say it again, I believe that all black people got issues. Oh yeah, no doubt. Absolutely. You can't. You cannot. So what is the path leading up to relationships? What should that path look like? Leading up to that commitment? Because it sounds like a lot of the work that you're talking about needs to take place outside of each other first and then together. So what does that look like leading up to the commitment piece? Um, knowing, knowing yourself and knowing what you want. Like a lot of black men, I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak um, from my own experience, my personal experience and, and, and what I know, like from people I know. A lot of black men that come home from prison, right, they got a girlfriend or a wife that held them down, been there for them, wrote them, came to see them and answered their calls, right? Mm -hmm. And w regardless of how long they've been in prison, life for her goes on, right? Mm -hmm. And so she is somewhat established compared to what he is going through. So when, and coming home from prison, you move with a woman, right? The average dude that come home from a prison, a prison the average brother, he end up moving in with a woman. And when he move in with a woman, Regardless if you pay all the bills for five years, 10 years, 15 years, it's still hers. So as soon as y'all disagree, what is she going to say? Get out. Now you're going to beat her up, <laughs> right? Because you're like, man, I've been paying bills. I've been doing all this. You're going to tell me get out. So you're going to go upside her head, right? But this is a process. This is by design. And, and, and we're not addressing those issues. Mm -hmm. So for a man coming home from prison, I think I, I, I'm definitely against men living with women. I'm against that. I don't care how much you love her and how much she loves you. If it's hers, you cannot be the king in her castle. Mm -hmm. You can't be. I don't care how much you love her, how much she loves you. It's her castle. And as soon as she gets mad, she's going to tell you to get out. And if she ain't got no knowledge herself, she's going to call the police to enforce you getting out. Right. Is it possible to get Jahar in on this discussion? Because I got a question for him. They, yeah, they, let me see. Let me take these headphones off. They just hop in here. <laughs> Come on, Jahar. We see your head. Take it out him. <laughs> Jahar, I hey, heard a very um, impactful discussion that you guys were having the other day. You know, I was on the phone and I was listening in and I heard you say something and you said that that my sister Hanifa has addressed on past shows. 
You said nobody wants to fight with the black woman. You remember that? You were saying that the black woman pretty much is hands off. And that is... She's infallible. She's infallible. <laughs> Do you, can you elaborate on that a little bit as to why you say that? Um, I was just saying just based on the historical context when uh, black women are organized and conscious, uh, nobody really want to fight for them. I mean, um, the history, you know, shows that the great amongst us, uh, the Harriet Tubman's, the Mary McLeod Bethune's, the Sojourner Truths, uh, I mean, you know, we could just go on and on. Um, Fannie Lou Hamer, Dr. Height, I mean, the best uh, you know, I think a lot of black women today take out a take it out of context when they say black women are the backbone of the family and the black community. The black community is failing miserably, and it's really because I think black women today misinterpret uh, what that statement was saying. I think I'll, um, you know, y'all use y'all beauty um, in the wrong way. I think that. Um, from the time we know there's a difference between uh, boys and girls, uh, boys do a lot of what we do for attention and acceptance from females. Mm -hmm. And I think it's evident that mothers today are more interested in their daughters being like Beyonce and uh, whatever their names are, Ariana Grande and all that, than Harriet Tubman and Soldier and the Troop. That's why we're in the condition that we're in. Mm -hmm. um, just like, for example, in D.C. right now, um, you know, uh, we got the facilities in D.C. are full of uh, juveniles that's incarcerated, and they only incarcerated for one reason, because they poor. Their parents don't have the money to uh, afford them an attorney. Well, um, you know, we live in a city where the mayor put a half a million dollars aside for illegal immigrants. I mean, just slow down what I just said and wrap your head around that. So we have people who are in this country illegally, but the mayor, a black woman, would take our tax dollars and put a half a million dollars up for their uh, legal defense. If that half a million was put up for the poor black kids that's locked up right now, all of them would be home. Maybe one or two percent are in there for violent crimes, for murder. Everybody else that's in there for riding in a stolen car, for theft, stealing clothes, stealing food, selling weed. If their parents could afford an attorney, they would come home. So, I mean, you know, I just think that if black women were serious about, uh, you know, our community and our lives, I think everybody else would just fall in line. This is what I think. Yeah, and you also mentioned um, something about how our children are in um, extracurriculars that relate to sports, but hardly ever in things that help stimulate their minds, like debate clubs and chess clubs and, you know, book clubs, stock market. Can you elaborate on that as well for us, please? Uh, absolutely. Uh, Europeans have used sports um, as a weapon against black, um, the black community. I mean, every black community is, you know, they want their sons to be the next Michael Jordan or the next uh, whoever the running back is or whoever the black quarterback is. So all of their time is spent in AU basketball or and unlimited football, uh, the Beltway League, the Wa Pop Warner, um, where I watched um, the Republicans who are in, um, in office there in the Senate right now, they control the Senate. Most people don't know that over the past two and a half years, they've appointed 150 judges to the lower federal court. And most of them are around 40 years of age, which means that they'll be shaping policy for the next 40 years yeah. whereas obama was in office uh for eight years and they only appointed 12 judges to the lower court so forget the supreme court we talking about the lower courts and what they understand is that if they're able to shape uh the policy and they can control the law that they're going to be able to control the land and all we want is for our sons to be the next lebron james i mean that's our greatest aspiration i mean I mean, I was walking, I was down at the um, harbor earlier this week, 
and everywhere I looked, it was teams of black kids, black boys and girls. They all play for team takeover and uh, this team and that team. I mean, <laughs> everybody's kid is a basketball player. Whose kid is going to be the scientist? Right. Whose kid is going to be the lawyers? Whose kid is going to be the accountant? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I think that we have so many misplaced values. But to me, the first teacher is the mother. And I don't talk and try to be nice to black women about this. I think this critical crisis that we in can be changed if the black woman really take responsibility. And some will say, well, the black man ain't doing what he's supposed to. Well, most of the time, if I investigated, the black man is not doing what he's supposed to. Nine times out of 10, he was raised by his mother. And so it goes back to the decision who she made to have a baby with. Because clearly, I mean, at 50, and I'm looking back downhill, I can see the females I was in a serious relationship with, the ones I paid attention to, I could see the, the correlation between them and their mother. Like I could see, like if I look at who their grandmother was and their mother was, I could see them. When I look at my men, I can see the same thing. I can look at their fathers, look at what kind of activities their fathers was in. I mean, and, and I can see the direct correlation between the way they are and, and their fathers, how they were raised. And so I said this to you before, I mean, and we laugh and joke about it, but you know, birds have really little brains, uh, but the female bird, the wren, travels around to 12 male nests before she decides who she gonna mate with. Cause she knows that if she pick wrong, her eggs are gonna fall and her young, her young gonna die in the street. Well, black women haven't adopted that yet. Like, you have babies by anybody. And then when the kid is crazy as hell, we like, I don't know why he act like this. He won't sit still. He, he can't be. Well, I mean, oh, the apples don't fall far from the tree. So and I have, until I have a, I have a question because right. earlier in the program, um, Edward uh, was, uh, Alkama mentioned there's this back and forth blame thing where it's, it's like, I think Edward, I don't know which one of you guys said it, but that's all right. Um, that it's like both sides are waiting to see who's going to go first. What does it look like when we as black women say, I'll go first? What does that look like? What begins to happen if, if we were to just collectively as black women say, you know what? We'll go first. We'll, be, we'll take accountability, we'll take responsibility, we'll step out first. What does that begin to look like? So I believe that's exactly what, what has to happen, and I believe that we're going to fall in line. I mean, I really, from where I sit, 50 looking downhill, I know y'all got the power for real. Uh, but I just also know that to whom much is given, much is required. And it takes a lot to be responsible for all of this mess. And it's a lot of mess. Mm -hmm. And I know that if, I just know simple stuff, like if girls in high school start saying, we don't talk to boys who don't go to school. Mm -hmm. I know most of these black boys don't go to school. Like, we don't talk to boys who don't pull their pants up. Like the parents don't have to tell kids to wear belts. The girls could tell them to wear belts mm -hmm. because they are attracted to like they accept this kind of behavior from boys. They're attracted to that. So until we get into the psyche of what where that comes from, uh, we won't never really be able to address it. You know what I'm saying? But I believe that um, I was saying to uh, Edward the other day, I can't go to a city in America and find black women meeting in a church every day, working on trying to how I'm gonna get my son not to kill your son. It ain't a movement like that nowhere in the country. But I can go to any shopping mall. I can go past any Vietnamese or Korean <laughs> nail salon or foot salon and see it packed with black women just sitting, waiting to get pettied and mannied up. And I'm just saying, your sons are murdering each other. I, I just, I know if a cat got kittens right here and I start to go bother her kittens, I know she going to die. She going to risk her life to protect her young. We the only people that this, you know, we just go have some Starbucks and cry a little bit and have a candlelight vigil and then we be on to the next one to do this all over again tomorrow. I just, I'm just like, my mind is just blown. Anyway, if y'all know the organization, I'm looking for one. I want to help financially, uh, whatever support I can lend to help. 
I think, um, I mean, y'all are the saving grace to our situation. And if, and if black women don't start organizing and demanding more from us, like I was telling our man, man, yesterday, I remember when I got locked up when I was 12 and the police came to my mother's house. She took them to my stash, everything I had in there I wasn't supposed <laughs> to have. She gave it to the police. The whole neighborhood was looking. They was like, man, your mother mean as hell. Your mother can't love you. And I'm walking around believing that. Like, But she told me the whole, since I was nine, if the police come here for you, I'm going to let them have whatever you got in here that ain't supposed to be in here. When you get locked up, don't call me. So I knew at an early age, I was on my own if I was going to break the law. And that helped shape me. I know guys who 40 now, they're still looking for their mother to put their house up. They're still, uh, you know, they they in trouble, so they want their mother to go take out a loan on the house, and they know they're going to jail. Right. And they're gonna let her use forty or fifty thousand. I was talking to my a girl that's like a sister to me the other day, and she was kind of, you know, talking about her son, and he's twenty three years old, and she was saying that she's still paying for a cell phone. And I'm like, well, is he a full time college student? And she was like, no, I'm like, is he in school? Like, what would the reason be that you would be paying his cell phone bill in 23? Yeah. Well, I mean, he's just on the plane with me. I mean, I, I mean, I could just go through. Yeah, I hear you. Because, yeah, and, enabling. How we killing these boys. Enabling our children leads to dysfunctional adults, really, because they're not in a position mentally to put, take care of themselves. And here we are. And you can see the results of that all everywhere we go. But we have run out of time. But what I do want to, you know, end on a on a on a proactive note, and so what I'm hearing you guys saying is that, um, you know, the women need to step up and do a little more, a lot more than what we've been doing, which is like host, you know, and I'm thinking for me, what comes to mind is like etiquette classes for young girls. If we know that, you know, what I'm saying that that the girls have this type of influence on the young men, then why don't we educate our young girls very young on how to have that influence on the brothers so they understand and recognize their own power. So, you know, we can be doing more of that. And it don't that don't take much. You can you can you can put on a class in your living room with a bunch of the community children. If you have a little bit better understanding and knowledge as to where, what we need in this day and time, you know, so I'm just putting a call out for, for all the sisters out there who are watching and who feel like nothing, what can I do? Well, you know, mentor, mentor a young girl or take on a course or, I mean, a class or, you know, t you know take more time with the, the young people in the community. So that's my advice. Like, like I always I go back to have a, I think we should have a conference. Uh, I think we should have a conference. We should bring some sisters and brothers together, and we should really build out a blueprint from people's life experiences. That's a great idea. And, I, um, I always go back to uh, I guess that would be <laughs> that would be the book of Exodus, I guess. <laughs> where uh, Moses is standing there and he's like, okay, here's this big old Red Sea. What, we're gonna, what, what are we going to do? And God is like, what is that in your hand? And that's always my thing. What is in your hand? What is, it, what is your strength? What are you good at? And that is what you use to help and uplift your people, period. Mm -hmm. We all have something to give. Mm -hmm. You know, we have this idea of categorizing people from least to greatest. We have this hierarchy based on classism. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't matter. I'm here to tell you it doesn't matter. I was a 13, 12 year old growing up in the housing projects in the Virgin Islands. And I used to gather the young children in the community. And I used to, we used to perform and go to shows. And it was something that they look forward to, to come out and practice. That's because that was in my days. I used to like to dance, you know, I still got it, but that was what I was good at. And so that's what I use as an adult. It's still looking at what are you good at? That is what you bring to the table. We all have something to contribute. We all have come something to contribute. So that's yeah. just my take on it. I agree. Good stuff. All right. You good, you good at that Bible, Hanifa? Yes, I am. <laughs> they had they beat me up good for years with it. I ought to be. 
Well, I, I want to make a quick mention that here at Everlasting Life on the first Saturday in September, I believe it's the third, but don't quote me. First Saturday in September from 2.30 to 4.30, we're going to be hosting a mental, uh, mental health uh, workshop. So we're going to be talking about that. We're going to bring some people in and we're going to be talking about the mental health issues in our community and how we can um, uh, forge forward in fixing some of our challenges that we find ourselves dealing with. So come on out for that. And for every first Saturday of the month, we're here doing something. So this first Saturday, it's a workshop, economic workshop. So come on out for that as well. It's always free at um, 2.30 to 4.30 p.m. Brothers, we thank you both so, so much for joining us. We wish you were right here beside us. I know that was the plan, but some things, sometimes things don't go as planned. But thank you so much for joining us on this session. Um, and until next week, family, take care of each other out there. All right. Peace. Peace.